All right, so you know, this morning um, we're here, I mean, and, and really this is where, why we gather each morning is to recognize you know, some of the contributions made by members of our community uh, in, in the field of catalysis. And I really think you know, this is really the right forum, right? All together in person to go through this. And this morning we're going to be recognizing the recipient of the uh, Lagutri Award. And in a moment we're going to be asking the co chair of the session, right? Um, to come, Jeff Rucker, and, and he will introduce the speaker for this morning. But first, just to kind of set the stage and, and give you some context, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the person that this award is named after. So Eugene Hundry, uh, he was originally from France, born there in Paris. He received his mechanical engineering degree uh, from a university just outside of Paris, where he won the gold medal, which means that he was ranked first in his, uh, in his class. Uh, his engineering skills after uh, graduation was first applied in the French military, where he was a decorated officer in the tank corps. And um, after that, after World War I, he came back and joined his father's uh, business. He was his father in the steel business. And uh, he joined him as an engineer, but he had a passion for racing and fast cars and making cars faster. And he quickly made the connection between the quality of the fuel that went into the engine and the performance of the engine and, and how fast that car went. And this is what really sparked or maybe catalyzed the, uh, the, the next 30 years of, of his life, right? In developing and, and commercializing new processes for the production of, of high quality fuels. Initially, that work was uh, funded by the French government, right? And the French government asked that uh, he worked on converting coal to gasoline, which was a technical success, but economically it wasn't competitive. So that funding was pulled back, and I, you know, I think we can all appreciate that in our kind of situation. But, he kind of persevered, was invited to come to the United States and demonstrate his work, took the learnings that he had from that project, applied them in the United States, and ultimately that led him to his lab in Paul, uh, Paulsboro, New Jersey, which if you're not familiar, is a, uh, is a town just across the river from Philadelphia. And just a few miles north from the Marcus Hope Refinery, which at the time was owned by Sun Oil. And uh, Sun Oil, after a few years of work, finally agreed to convert one of their thermal crackers into a uh, Hoodry Catalyst Cracker, and it was a you know, overwhelming success, right? They significantly increased the production of high octane gasoline, which for the time was a, a very big technical, uh, technical milestone. So through the 1940s, this process became widely adopted. They started making, uh, building manufacturing plants for catalysts, and that was just in time for World War II, where he continued his support of the war effort, developing new fuels and supplying high quality aviation fuel. Uh, for the um, for for the uh, for the world, and uh, but then after World War II, he turned his attention to something else that was starting to bother him, which was the uh, health effects and the environmental implications of the fuel that was combusted in the in the engine. So he started thinking about ways that he could use the the catalyst to to clean up the exhaust of the the automobile, and that led him to developing the first catalytic uh, converters for an automobile. And, uh, and, and ultimately, he received the first, one of the first patents in the field in 1956. Here we see a picture of, uh, of Houdry and one of his uh, uh, favorite Bugattis, right? So this is the race car that he used in France during his early work. And uh, today, he would take the engine off this beautiful car and put it on a test stand and, and maybe do more methodical work. But I think his uh, you know, application of, uh, of testing was, was much more fun. He would, you see the external gas canister that was mounted to the, to the side of the car. He put his experimental fuels in there and then test how far or how fast uh, the car would go. So if you're not familiar, uh, the Hoodry Award has been given out for about well, 50 years now, uh, almost exactly. And it's recognized achievements in the application of catalysis. And, and here we see a list of uh, past recipients of this award. I think we'd all agree that this represents a very distinguished group of, of our colleagues in, in, our, in our community. This morning, we're going to add one more to this list. And now I'm going to invite my co-chair, Jeff Berger, up to the stage to introduce this year's recipient. Thank you, Lucas. It's a true honor for me to introduce Dr. Dang Dang Chan, or Lenny Olio Key, for his Hoodry Award lecture. I've known Key wise since we were in graduate school together. He joined Yule Key after getting his PhD in Intermediate Chemistry and has risen to senior fellow at the highest level you can achieve in a company, and actually a level very few people have reached in our hundred year history. 
first contributions for catalysis in <clears throat> aromatics, derivatives, and olefins. Specific contributions, he's invented and developed commercialized catalysts for alkylation of humine and living alkyl benzene on large scale, and also advanced catalysts for aromatic isomerization and transit alkylation, cornerstones of the aromatic complex. And for that, he's been awarded over 100 US patents. He also was a key contributor and inventor in uh, metal catalyzed dehydrogenation for lighting and heavy paraffins. We worked together on that for a long time. <clears throat> Something you can't read about him wise, you know, he's been a tremendous mentor to young scientists and engineers, UOP. And he forged a strong bond with the new materials and characterization groups. And that really led to guidance on new zeolite materials needed, what kind of structures, what kind of structure function. Uh, properties we need and uh, help scale up as well. And uh, to this day, he's not slowing down at all. He's working on two of our biggest new breakthrough technologies right now that he can't talk about. But uh, with that, I'll introduce Steve Wai to uh, for his lecture on uh, aromatic uh, catalyst and derivative catalyst using Z like catalyst. Steve Wai. Uh, 
And uh, so a lot of the catalysis um, started to trace back to his way of work. So my focus today will be the production of uh, benzene and, and uh, uh, parasite E. And when the parasite is really the focus of this, uh, 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 the, the main focus of this talk. And what I'm trying to see, and this is the process that starts from the NASA and, and go to the basic design and eventually go to the parasite and that goes to the polyester and PEG. And this is a, one of the biggest uh, petrochemical uh, intermediate uh, or product that uh, done did the thing of our historic development at the OP. And uh, it takes a historic significance for us. And so it has been put dear and hard, uh, dear to our heart. And the key technology or component technology going into this is the first part of this platform developed by Bell and Salt back in 1949. And the second piece in the third piece is the Parrax. And down the road and uh, come in event is what we consider to be the watershed uh, uh, breakthrough technology is very consumption so that's uh, operating in the center of the moving bed. And, and the third piece would be the tagway and also isomer and that is responsible for the shoveling of the LT group within the old man complex. So this is driven the demand for the polyester and PET is mainly driven by this so-called protective gap between the development and the, 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 uh, the, the developed world. And you can see the demand for this product has been climbing very steadily over the year and expected to be the climb at a rate that greater than compound average growth rate of a global GDP is today or greater. So if I look at the back of what how these three components of uh, technology that uh, was developed over the first 25 years of this parallax technology. It started with platform in parallax and also the isomer and then a tagway. This took about 25 years. And during the working, working coming up with this uh, parallax technology to purify and recover the parallax A, this is one of the most difficult separation that uh, one can come up with at the time. Uh, UOP were exposed to uh, synthesis zeolite uh, uh, and, and realized the value of the synthesis zeolite. And that kind of paid the work to form the collaboration and eventually uh, to form the joint venture with a section of Unicapi, the legacy catalysts in the process of building of Unicapi. And in that happened in 1998, and the rest of it is history. And what I would like to talk today mostly is the, uh, the work about museum. And around 2000, I was done with the product development work, and I was asked to evaluate into the uh, uh, zeolithic synthesis effort and name the UOP zeolithic material. And this is led by a uh, scientist, Greg Lewis, and for a uh, large part is responsible by another person called Adam Moscoso. And so we have a very, very substantial uh, effort in two times. So we're trying to revive uh, or trying to look at the zero synthesis uh, uh, from the new uh, perspective. And, and, and also the job was to look at whether there are opportunity, application opportunity across EOP technology or application portfolio. <coughs> Whether it be in the field or in the petrochemical. So, an example I'm going to give are the, what's happening in the old man complex, specifically 3D technology, tagging, liquid phase like sun, and also powering the television. So, under this program, right now we have about 60, over 60 nuclear material. They are either structurally distinct or uh, they are morphologically distinct, and oftentimes they are also uh, the zero one that may used to be made by a very complicated structure-directed reagent. 
So, so we have a set of criteria before we do today in the sequence of the discovery. And one of the things about museum program is their criteria. One is they need to be commercially viable. Although it's still expensive, but they need to be able to scale up and commercially viable and useful to our technology. And uh, so the concept to drive it is really a little different. It's something called charge density mismatch. Without delving into the detail, uh, the essence of a charge density mismatch is to scale back or delay the, the driving force to work crystallization. So one thing you see in Beverly, we are seeing a non crystalline with a well structure, secondary morphology is being made through this method. And that becomes useful for industry application. And the other thing we also learn as we go is morphology, after that morphology learns, we will get in some material, you will have a wave control. I would say, you know, at least we think that I have good control for the placement of a framework T side out on the Z line. And that particular aspect of it, it becomes very useful when you have a system that after you overcome the competitive competition between the improving the mass transport, that particular tool is become useful for the improvement of the molecular transformation. And in these are the examples that uh, I'm given here. I'm going to touch a little bit about more than that and end it up in the So, essentially, what I learned in my last few years, and I don't think I'm getting very interested in this, is about you know, trying to learn a little bit more about heterogeneous analysis. How the elementary step of the heterogeneous analysis play out in the commercial system. And you know it's pretty difficult for those who do anything commercial uh, context because we are driving the max, maximum amount of uh, yield and efficiency and over the time those elementary piece, pieces are really hard to get through it. So this is just a tangle from our side that we try to share with you a little bit of what we learn. So a little bit of chemistry, what we see in the, um, uh, the you know, starting from the NASA of the crew and then going to the CCR, uh, there's something called breath from it. And that is going to convert to eventually to the uh, sorry. Uh, eventually convert it to the and the parasite. So how does this molecular transformation take place if I may use one slide to show So the product of so called the breath of it's actually it's a mixture of non-aromatic, aromatic, and a little bit heavier. And that molecular identity is actually, is not, we have only about 30% of the uh, aromatic is actually uh, xylene. And you have a lighter and you have heavy aromatic. So non-aromatic you need to deal with, and this distribution has to be in a so, in addition, not only you have methyl, but you also have ethyl, you have topio, and you have butyl, which we need to deal with as well. So, essentially, in order to get everything aligned, interconverted, to make the benzene and parazine, the reaction that we need to work on would be moving the methyl around through transalkylation and acylation, and DL, clip off the C to the C4. And the characteristic of this particular fee kind of translate to what how much of benzene as defined by metal to ratio define how much of this benzene and xylene it is. So here in Nashville, we do the you know, take out the nano or to extract the uh, distillation. We shuffle the metal around, remove the uh, clip of the uh, longer key, and then what we do is we extract the parasite through some people's selective absorption, so that's Tarek's technology, and then we establish the equilibrium and come around again. So throughout this process, we really want to see whether we can attain the maximum amount of phenol and the methyl functional group, and that's one way to define our efficiency. 
So the two things, the molecular transformation efficiency has to find earlier and also the energy consumption. So this first example of category is something most of you are very familiar with, and, and uh, but I'm going to share what we learned from here. And this is mainly driven by these three scientists. And, uh, and I'm going to say a little bit about it at the end. So the way you look at it, at all, you know, is look at step of this stuff, is focus on moving the metal around and looking at it from a model range of perspective and then go back and see what does it mean in a commercial context. So in a simple way, the, we are looking at the two models here, you know, lighter and heavy, and you can go through this proportionation and can go through transformation. And one thing you don't want to happen is the disproportionation of a heavy molecule. And, and historical just progression, if you look at that, you know, the, the, the event of the uh, zeolite, starting from a larger three-dimensional zeolite to the use of one-dimensional logical zeolite. And the way it played out in this model reaction is, as you become narrower in the topology to one-dimensional, you are seeing there are more and more xylene and, and, and the basic production combined. And, and that is by excluding the disproportionation of the uh, heavy aromatics. And, and so that comes with uh, at the expense of the lower uh, heavy product. So they seem to work very logically. And so there is selective, uh, competitive, competitive absorption, selective absorption of a light aromatic that take control of this development. But this also uh, best uh, can be illustrated in this particular paradigm chart of the relative activity when comparing the, uh, the relative activity of the uh, uh, light and heavy molecule. And what you, you want to be, you want to be in the middle. And, and uh, so, but the, but the coming to us is, you know, if that's the case, there exists a potential issue for the mass transport of a heavy molecule in such a high confined uh, one dimensional zero light, which most of us have learned, but with the model of compound uh, testing, that simply supported it. But the other potential issue is the site activated the heavy molecule probably are very limited in such a time that I couldn't find the zero. So indeed, when we look at the new day 14, and then what we see is it gives a very large improvement in activity. And accompanied with that, we are seeing the reactivity of the, uh, of the lighter and heavy molecules starting to come for parity that show up as better lighting, lower weight loss. So that seems to coincide with the com uh, model compound testing and the hypothesis. And this is a picture of the UGA 14. And one thing we first saw is that two things we look at it. One is crystallite small, and also the morphology is very discreet, and the second secondary morphology. And that's important for scaling up, you know, important you know, to have a material that you could count on in terms of Orthodoxy from which to push the, the, the boundary of the version. And then what Evan did is he took the measurement of crystal like layer and trying to correlate it with the character activity. And the only thing that correlated really well is the crystal layer along the C direction, which is a large force. Uh, and so this gives us the confidence that indeed that how this system works. But then the next question is, could this system also be very limited in terms of the active side of the required to activate the heavy polymeric? And this is where we touch a little bit about the crystallization, uh, crystallographic uh, side. And you can see that the, this is on the left, left side, there are two channels, one is 12 read where the projection takes place, and the other one will be the uh, A and the And then, so if you look at the crystal side perspective, typically what we are looking at is there will be a side below main to the main channel, E, and there's a side A in the A ring which does not precipitate, 
of a participant. And then the other one is side D at the intersection of a 12 and an 8 really open. Mm -hmm. If you turn out, and what we see is, if, if you look up the literature, it appears that the quality of the control molecule is able to interact with side E, but not partially with D, and obviously not A. Because the molecular similarity, structural similarity with the trimetal mechanism, we wonder if whether this is a way to control the active site, to activate the heavy molecule. And that was the question we asked ourselves. So through some modification of what we are seeing is we are able to, so when we modify it, the UVA 14, and what we are seeing is this UVA 14 actually were able to find the reactivity improvement through the modification. And that modification, actually, the activity enhancement is actually scaled with the SSI measured by column D. So this seems to somewhat affirm the part of the hypothesis is. So if you put in the historic context I showed earlier, there's a continuous improvement of the Xylene plus benzene combined, again, at the expense of a heavy molecule. And this is a molecule test. And the hypothesis we have is because so if you look at the site location and where will we open up in terms of spaciousness, it was happening, we think, at the intersection of both the and the marine. And when that ring is opened up, it actually opened up a place for accommodated heavy aromatics. And, and one thing that's most interesting and most, uh, what we think is, is most significant is this particular enhancement actually applied across the feed that has, is very concentrated in heavy or is very concentrated in power. And the most pronounced improvement is coming from the one that most concentrated in light aromatic, because that's where it's most severe in terms of the projected resorption uh, from the light, uh, uh, from the heavy aromatic perspective against the light aromatic. So what we are able to learn is through picking a, a small crystal light, uh, more than nine, and then open up the side for additional activation of heavy uh, aromatic, we are able to see additional activity improvement. And then we are able to see the increased anxiety, and we are able to see that, that while we are, where we are now, we are actually pretty close to the parity, considering the relative activity of the lighter versus heavy one uh, aromatics. So the next thing I want to talk a little bit about is, is really is a, is a fun project from my perspective because we came up with the UGA 54 uh, many years and then, uh, and, then, uh, and, and then there has been a parallel effort about trying to bring in the, the uh, xylene isomerization process from the middle phase to the liquid phase. And, and part of the reason is even though the amount of xylene generally of the uh, isomer is not very high, but every time what you have is you have only 25 percent, 24, 25 percent of the uh, of per perazine that being extracted. So there's a very large of a recycle for the so-called refinement, what's not being extracted, and that keeps circling around, and that has to pass through a vapor phase isomerization process. And so there's a, you know, the key that you require to, to, for, to, that you have to put in to, to vaporize. So that, you know, that therapy is really is part of the reason that it's kind of an energy cost is, is higher than the desire. And the other thing that's been done also is EV doesn't get separated too well. So, and they tend to be recycled in the rejected stream and reflected. And so they need to be key out. And so that need can then convert it to benzene. So there are two processes that need to be accomplished in this particular unit operation. 
And, and so the way we test out whether this can be done in, in the uh, In, in different phases, we were first, we were trying to stack the two particular reactions and trying to arrange them in the, in the stack configuration. And that first is to selectively admit the EB and exclude the metal and also the ID two shapes selected. And so you can do that very easily, in, I should say easily, uh, very comfortably in, in, in the different phase. So only if you get admitted, and we're hoping it will be DLP, and then hydrogen will form the basin and uh, ethyl. And as far as I mean, then when you come down to the, uh, the leg position of the reactor, then you can do the xylene isolation. And both time in a different phase. And because xylene isolation is an easier reaction, we thought we would try that first. And the exercise is try to is try to maximize the EB conversion, attain the three steps to ZID equilibrium, and minimize the ZID loss. And inevitably, you know, in, in, if you have to do this in an elevated temperature, and this reaction will take place. So you're going to lose the ZID you really try very hard to make. And then you have to recover uh, through fractionation and reconversion. So this is the reaction we want to be minimized. We want to minimize. So it turned out we came up with the museum 54 uh, earlier, a number of years before we started this. And what we see and what we saw is that uh, we can achieve very high medical surface area at a crystal size of around 10 nanometer and very high crystallinity greater than 80 when it reaches about 15 uh, nanometers. And the thing about this synthesis, also this synthesis is done at, uh, at a very low uh, silicon ratio domain. So this fit uh, the higher activity and also good master, master of body, it fit the profile of liquid phase uh, isolation. So if you look at that, the question we really ask is, is the liquid phase isolation reaction is going to be in good part. Uh, that barrier uh, is contributed by the intracrystalline diffusion limitation. And that was the question we asked. And it turned out, yeah, we were able to, if you compare it to the regular zero that we use, now, and if I see that we can use, and we are able to move this by 40 degrees Celsius. And, and what we have to see, that lower temperature to Exterior design design essentially uh, suppress the design loss, which is that relationship. So, this is the part that's probably relatively easy compared to the, the reaction of uh, EBTL in liquid phase because we had very little idea of how this is going to work out. Because what I learned is EBTL relation is much more difficult. Uh, that's what we've done over the years. And, 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 and so, without with that knowledge, so I, I went and asked the, uh, our uh, theoretical the computational scientists, uh, you know, asking what can I do? How can you explain the differences of the operation reactivity between ethyl and, and isopropyl benzene? And, and he said, you know, I, I think it's his conclusion is it's really not it's not coming off. It, it's the uh Habinian have trouble getting off the surface. And you need something else to help out. And so when we come to that point that really is uh, one thing that left in the two parts is really is the tweak in the hydrogenation function. And so and hope that improved hydrogenation function will improve the DE here. Uh, and, and that's what we see that we want to put in what I call the uh, quote unquote uh, uh, right hydrogenation functions that activate hydrogen able to alleviate and help overcome that steep uh, uh, elementary step uh, activation energy to get to help off the surface. And the second term of the reaction you see invariably is a 
almost close to quantitative formation of ether. So what if that ether leaving coming off the chain is getting androgyny and making the ether, and that is done at a relatively low temperature. And that's how we suppress and help or mitigate the lighting loss in the transaggregation reaction. So right now with this particular process, what we learn is we are able to switch that off the big phase and, and, and move into the liquid phase and that will save us an appreciable amount of fuel gas consumption operating this thing and also appreciable amount of what that means uh, uh, increase. The last thing, last, not the last thing, the last uh, example I will show you the powder methylation and I know that's something I have for the public uh, institution as well. And, and so, but I've shared about what we learned about this uh, powder methylation. And uh, again, this is a one other fun project we had, and uh, it was not in the AOP, but we somehow. Uh, you know, our system the organization has a room for us to do a proof of principle and then move and then everything anyway and move, move on to a, uh, you know, into our portfolio. So, one thing you look at the uh, transactivation of the uh, standard peroxidine uh, production uh, without the power ventilation, and it was supposed to be tolerant plus, you know, the lighter as, as a lighter uh, or magnet. But here we use bathing as a lighter aromatic and transparency with a heavy aromatic. And the purpose of that is to produce toluene. And that toluene will then be able to move into a reactor with methanol and, and to make selectively phosphor yeah, to a paradigm. And the higher concentration of paradigm is very useful because as you look at over here, that really will eliminate the bottleneck for the paradigm union. Because if you have a more concentrated paradigm stream going to the parax, that reduces the recycle a great deal. And out of the time, that will the bottleneck if the customer wants to increase the throughput. Historically, we folks have been doing. Um, Methyl polymethylation to parasite by controlling the whole mouth through a variety of approach. And that approach includes something like you, know, you, you, you select it and strain the whole mouth or partially collapse the whole mouth. And this means to attain the parasite selectivity uh, through shape selectivity, uh, shapes, shapes selective underlying principle. Is typically operating at 500 to 600 C, and then the metronome realization is about 40 to 60 uh, percent. It doesn't mean that they are not that being wasted, it just means they are not being used to make top parasite. They are actually the two pathways, it's a temperature increase, the tolerance is oxygenation coming into play, and also metronome to all of you and, and gasoline. Uh, that comes into play. And this is a very well uh, uh, reasoned uh, based on the thermodynamic analysis. So, so the way, one way to do this is if you can run the uh, common information at a lower temperature and elevated pressure, in theory you can get a very high side in. The question is, will carries survive at all in abundance of oxygen, in, which we consider to be poison? And with the care society at all under the hydrothermal condition because the framework T size is not going to come off. So those are the two big questions uh, for us. And, and obviously one thing that we do about the low temperature is at high temperature we have to carefully design engineering wise to minimize the thermal decomposition method. So this is what we are seeing is where we screen a bunch of the zeolite and then at 270C and, and 400 power, what we see is that we can get a pretty decent uh, conversion, 20 to 20%. But what we also notice is there are almost like two categories. One category 
is making perizyme, and the other category is making orthodiety. And that kind of intriguing. And then if you focus on the first four, they are actually are the material with a similar structure. And so when you can switch from perizyme to orthodiety, and, and orthodiety also is a very useful uh, petrochemical intermediate. Um, and so, so that's intriguing us. And, and one thing we notice also is that uh, other than the high PS, not the kind of you know, 90, 99% of PS we're talking about, but reasonably high PX. And, and, and also, and we have very high mechanization, and, and also the secondary calculation is reasonably suppressed. And we also found this tab actually came around more than three months, and then you can turn around, although it's not necessarily have to turn around at the end of three months, and then it's a rejected report. So basically, hydrothermal is stable as well. But how did this happen, switching from the paradigm to the selective? And this is kind of reminding the uh, organic chemistry I learned that uh, the metal group is, is a parent or also a uh, direct uh, uh, group. And that seems to match the homogeneous metallurgy system. And, and indeed, this is a kinetic control system when we look at the activation energy of this particular system of we in and, 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 yeah, and one thing with this is, oh, curious is, as most of you probably come to this point, you will say, how about you feed some really bottom molecule? And we have done the uh, molecular model before, and we kind of know, and there's some collaboration with the open literature, is this open large bulky molecule is capable of interacting with T1, T2, T3, but not six headed a day. So when we put this poison molecule in there, we can see the activity suppressed a little bit. But you can see the parents go up, now it is over 70%. And now you can see the, uh, the primary regulation is way up to nine. So this is what we realized, and then we kind of speculated early on, is by synthesis, you could get to a very different place, even though you got a similar structure, although somewhat different morphology. So this formation of the surface, this uh, finding of the surface as a part, uh, across the acid side, it's actually it's better or more precisely interpreted in terms of T side location in the MTT uh, framework. And, and what you are seeing is we are able to control the, this active side distribution by, uh, by controlling synthesis. And we also are, able, as you can see here, and, and so we can have similar structure but two vastly different uh, performance in terms of pair, parasitic activity. And also when you use when we found a way, if you found a way to selectively remove the those T1, 2, and 3, you can see all this red car is out there. So this is what we think that happening is by modification and by direct synthesis we could actually have a handle or further improvement in terms of the reactive TS activity. And so, to answer the question of hydrothermal, I think the experiment that you will design is okay. Does this thing actually deallocate? And indeed, it does. Uh, you know, if you estimate the amount of steam at 400 pounds, partial pressure, and you can see it's both the fresh or reject gas coming out of the Low temperature carbon regulation, they lost about a certain time. And this is a kind of a, a one week uh, accelerated steam or up to the minute about 30 days on the stream. But when it did put the steady gas on, you know, that has a lot of activity uh, as close to the carbon to fresh into this stream, and there's hardly any change. And, and so he went ahead and looked at it with our Titan uh, uh, STEM instrument. And uh, the C with the NWW, uh, it looked like it has slight expansion of the unicellular. So when the space is filled, essentially uh, the micro is filled with the coke. And then that also being 
And so, so apparently, the severe delimitation is only happening in the asteroids of a code. And that fast buildup of the code within the micropore uh, actually serves as protection for this process to work. And that's additional you know, analysis of a code uh, that are mainly over the zero, the zero line. So we're going to like the analysis and the use the state. So this opened up a great deal of flexibility for parasite production. So depending on the change in demand of the customer and the market, there's some flexibility building. And also this serves as a way to really bring down the, the, the feed consumption efficiency. Uh, because the technical economic uh, as a first tool is always a micro transformation, the differentiation, differentiation between the feed and the product and, and how Efficient as it would be, and that dictate how much money you can spend on capital and how much cash you have for maintaining the regular operation. And, and so, and the other one is also it is allow us to bring in a romantic which is made from light uh, NAFTA, which invariably make many highly amazing, and, and I think we could upgrade that to uh, to paradigms. So to conclude the, uh, my discussion today uh, is the uh, we are able to <coughs> in a regular standard operation of the uh, automatic uh, complex, um, we are able to apply our knowledge in terms of the mass transport com competitive resolution and, and the service size. Um, in, in terms of what are the important exercise to activate the heavy of man, we are able to achieve uh, uh, between the better, good morphology and the modification, we would like to achieve a 30 40 degrees operating temperature reduction. And then in the vapor phase high sun, we are able to bring it down from vapor to vapor phase by applying the nano material. And, and one thing I have to say is, oh, you know, one can make an animal very easy, but to make an animal useful, oftentimes it's more complicated than that. And I have some difficult success, and this is a wonderful case that actually we came out okay. And I will always try to understand, you know, why it works and how it works. And, and so, and I always come to the point that maybe, in addition to the nano, uh, the crystal light, you also need to have a well structured secondary tertiary morphology. And because eventually, when you push the Zyde from uh, isolation conversion, the measles will be a transition from the micro to the measles uh, mass surgical surgical machine. And lastly, with the uh, low temperature problem inflation, what we are able to see is we know, we kind of know where the active sites are, and we kind of know. How to control the active site to secondary modification, but also through primary synthesis, and to get something as high as 70% um, on TMCX and very high the primary alkylation aspect uh, as well. And that is done at the temperature of the, uh, at the elevated pressure and temperature less than PPC. So now everything is going be down to a temperature it they will be easier to integrate it and then be easy to integrate it between the separation and the reaction. And that's how we are able to achieve the molecular uh, transformation efficiency and operating uh, energy cost efficiency. Uh, okay, so that is my last slide, and I want to say a few words because, you know, I, I, I've been kind of famed for uh, pathway analysis for the last 10 years, so it's right. And one thing I can, I'm trying to understand, not how to do it, but to, to understand all the elements going to it. And, and so as time grows, I, I think that, you know, for something to happen, if it's meaningful at all, it's usually, it's a very, it, it's a, what I call event analysis. And the, the elements going in there, and it's, it, you know, become clear, right? So, so I think that these are the people, these are the champion, these are visionaries, saying we have to do it. And uh, sometimes, you know, our, and our management tend to be uh, 
they also tend to be uh, the best, you know, technically, good and bad. They are the best chemist, they are the best uh, chemical engineer, they are the best modeling, theoretical chemist. And they, if they step away from that line of job, they still, you know, they are changing for this line of work that I talk about today. And the other thing also is, I, I have to say, you know, uh, the two people in this group, these are the group that all remain that will be there, and that they all become through organic technology. And, and oftentimes, you know, we would be asked, you know, you know, you know sometimes is how much it costs to do scale this thing up, and especially when it comes to big things. And, and, and I think we are fortunate at UOP, and this is a very good example, right? The, the technology leader, uh, Jim Johnson and Patrick Richards, the first question were, they were asked how long this not the cost, is how does this work? And what is the underlying principle? They have to be bought in. And then we were talking about the second line for the how do we do the scale up? So, so these are the early adopters of some of these museum material, and that really kept the momentum of the research work. And the last group of people, uh, these are the people I can go ask questions, any question, and, and these are the people who are telling me, do you like this is not going to work? And they are very competitive. Okay, doesn't matter who you are, what position you are, they are their answer is always the same. They will be polite, but they're very direct. And, and on top of that, they're going to tell you what they think. And they will work through the process of how they work through it. So, this, uh, if I do something, uh, these are a group of young scientists and engineers I really follow. So, 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 that will conclude my talk today. Thank you, Thank you very much.